Hey friends, I am so glad you're joining us today. We are in a series titled Miracle Makers. And our big idea in this series is that the multi-ethnic church of the first century was a miracle. There had never been anything like it. One historian gives us this description. From earliest years, Christianity went trans-ethnic and trans-local, addressing males and females of all social levels and generating circles of followers who were expected to commit to particular beliefs and behavior from the point of initiation. Though initially small and insignificant, the movement continued to grow and spread geographically, quickly obtaining a salience and having an impact well beyond its numbers. Now, I'm convinced, convinced that that is the kind of church that Jesus is building in the 21st century. Translocal, multi-ethnic, men and women, people from every economic and social background, fully devoted and having an impact way beyond our numbers. Now, to help us achieve this vision, we've been taking a closer look at some of the miracle makers in the book of Acts. Men and women, just like us, who believe God to do something way beyond themselves. And so today, we're gonna to conclude this series by taking a look at a man named James and one of the most pivotal moments in the history of the church. Let's read together in Acts 15. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Let's pause a moment and pray. Lord God, we give you praise. Lord, we love you. Father, there is no one like you. Thank you, God, that you are the ultimate miracle maker. God, I thank you that you are at work right now, wherever we are. Father, I'm asking that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to believe all that you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Now, this was not a minor point of contention. This got to the very heart of the gospel. In fact, this issue touched everything because for Jewish people, the law of Moses touched everything. For over a thousand years, the Jewish people have been defined by the law of Moses. I mean, the law of Moses determined the Jewish calendar. The law told Jewish people what to eat and how to eat. The law shaped work and worship and borrowing an animal from your neighbor and lending money. The law addressed diseases and sex and childbirth and how we should treat our parents. It was impossible to separate Jewish identity from the law of Moses. And so this question about the relationship between the law and the gospel couldn't ultimately be separated from questions about ethnicity and culture. Is the gospel essentially a mono-ethnic, monocultural message for an essentially mono-ethnic, monocultural community, or is there something bigger going on? What is this gospel all about? And what kind of community is God trying to produce? Now, some believers who were Pharisees from Judea had an answer, a Jewish one, a Jewish one. The gospel is basically a Jewish gospel and the community is basically a Jewish community. Sure, the Gentiles were welcome to join them, but only if they became them. Now, in the first century, this was not such a crazy thing to believe. I mean, a lot of Old Testament texts could certainly be read that way. I mean, consider this passage from the book of Isaiah. In the last days, many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
Now that sounds pretty Jewish, right? I mean, the peoples will go to the temple of the God of Jacob. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I mean, most Jews assume that the kingdom of God would basically precipitate a Jewish revival. I mean, yes, some Gentiles might participate, but this was basically going to be a Jewish phenomenon. So how did the church, which began as a small group of Jewish believers, go through such a massive cultural shift that they became a global multi-ethnic movement? And how do we foster those kinds of cultural shifts in our context? Well, that's the question we want to unpack today. And I wanna focus on four key elements that emerge in Acts 15. Conviction, the Holy Spirit, priorities, and urgency. Conviction, the Holy Spirit, priorities, and urgency. Number one, conviction. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that leaders like Barnabas and Paul or Peter and James were basically very dogmatic figures who had rules about everything. I mean, my way or the highway. Well, in fact, that's not the case. We find just the opposite. When Paul is uh, writing to those in Rome, listen to what he says. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another eats only vegetables. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? See, Paul understood that there were a whole variety of issues on which people could legitimately disagree. Now, we ought to keep this same thing in mind, especially in an election year, right? Now, that being said, we also need to understand that every major culture-shaping movement has been undergirded by a core conviction. I mean, at the end of the day, preferences don't change the world. It takes conviction. Paul recognized that the issues that were surfacing in Antioch were not mere preferential issues. They touched the heart of the gospel. I mean, here was the question. Is loyalty to Jesus the necessary and sufficient core of the gospel? Or does the people need to have devotion to the law of Moses as well? See, Paul saw the answer clearly. It's Jesus plus nothing. It's Jesus plus nothing. And because it's Jesus plus nothing, there's essentially no difference between Jew and Gentile. I mean, as Paul puts it in his letter to the Ephesians, one Lord, one faith, one spirit, one baptism, one hope means one body. And therefore, we should make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Look, our gospel is a gospel of reconciliation. Yes, first and foremost with God himself, but also with one another. This is not an add-on. It's at the heart of the gospel. It's at the heart of the message that Jesus preached. I mean, Jesus put the mistreatment of our brothers and sisters and indifference toward reconciliation in the same category as murder. One of his disciples, John, wrote this. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. Justice, reconciliation, a multi-ethnic church, these are at the very heart of the gospel. They are gospel issues. Look, Paul didn't give his life for these things because he thought they were cool and progressive. He gave his life because they were understood, he understood that they were core components of the gospel. Now this is what Martin Luther King Jr. saw so clearly, and this is why he pressed the white Christian leaders of his day to join his cause. Listen to what he says. Though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? 
Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. What are your convictions? What are your convictions? See, if your convictions center around yourself, eventually you're gonna die alone. But if your convictions center around the gospel, then being a reconciled church is non-negotiable. Now, all of this leads to a very important question. How should we actually determine our core commitments? I mean, how do we know what we should hold loosely and what we should give our lives for? I don't know about you, but I watch people die on the wrong hills all the time. You're really gonna sacrifice your marriage for a video game? You're really gonna bail on church because of one sermon? You're really gonna give up that friendship because of a political issue? I mean, some of us need to rethink our convictions. Sometimes we need to take a fresh look at what we believe and what our commitments really are. Now, Acts chapter 15 helps us here. It gives us a window into how the men and women of the early church arrived at their core commitments. And here are four fundamental building blocks that we find. The preeminence of Jesus, the scriptures, personal experiences, and the wise counsel of brothers and sisters. I wanna look at each one of these for just a moment. The preeminence of Jesus. Look, Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. There was nobody else in his category. I mean, the Apostle Paul, before he encountered Jesus, basically centered his entire life around the law. But listen to what he writes to the Colossians. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. All of these were elements of the law. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Listen to what he's saying. The things of the law, those things he had devoted his entire life to, he's now saying they're just a shadow. There's no substance to them. The substance is found in Jesus. Later on, he told the Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. See, when you're considering your core commitments, you've got to ask yourself, do my commitments reflect the reality that Jesus is Lord over everything with no rivals? I mean, where's my confidence? Where's my hope? Where's my love? Is it in Jesus above everything else? When the apostles and elders met in Jerusalem to figure out this issue of salvation and the law of Moses, Peter summed things up this way. Why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. It's Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing. Jesus has the preeminence in all things. Secondly, the scriptures. Now, the apostles and elders recognized that they were not the first people that God had ever spoken to. The scriptures provided them an inspired record of God's words and his deeds throughout the generations. This is why the New Testament is filled with quotations of the Old Testament. I mean, Jesus himself alluded to the Old Testament writings over and over again. So in Acts chapter 15, when James, the brother of Jesus, weighed in on the discussion, he turned to the scriptures. Simon Peter has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. When we're forming our core convictions, we need to ask ourselves, do my commitments have agreement with the scriptures? Thirdly, personal experience. Now, all of us have been profoundly shaped by our experiences. 
Or maybe I should say, all of us have been profoundly shaped by our interpretations of our experience. I mean, have you ever noticed that two people can experience the same thing and yet come away with very different perspectives? And all the married people said, amen. The question then is, will we listen to the Holy Spirit in the middle of our experiences? Look, God is always speaking. He has not left us to figure out life on our own. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. See, God intends to teach us through the experiences that we walk through in this life. That's why God arranged for Peter to have this encounter with this Gentile man, Cornelius, before he arrived at this moment in Acts chapter 15. I mean, listen to what Peter told the others. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. See, this idea that God could save the Gentiles apart from the law of Moses was not theoretical for Peter. He had experienced it himself. Now, do you know why so many white people don't have strong convictions about racial justice? Because we have no experience. We have no experience. Have you ever had someone try to give you an opinion on a subject that they know almost nothing about and you have a whole bunch of experience in in your life? I mean, how does that usually go? I mean, this happens to me sometimes as a pastor. Someone will say, boy, it must be nice working only on Sundays. Oh yeah, it's awesome. Way easier than leading an organization that engages thousands of people on the most controversial, sensitive, and important topics in their lives on a daily basis. Way easier than that, right? All of us make that mistake sometimes. We just don't know all the time what we don't know. Now here's the lesson. We need to hold on to our opinions loosely until we get some up close and personal experience. Build some relationships, get close and listen. Now this is the power of a multi-ethnic church. If we will walk together in our diversity, then we just might learn something from one another. Fourthly, the wise counsel of brothers and sisters. The wise counsel of brothers and sisters. No matter how much any of us experience, we will never get the full picture on our own. We need the input of others. The decisions that were ultimately made in Acts chapter 15 were the result of a group effort. Listen to how Luke describes it. Some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. After much discussion. Look, don't form your core convictions on your own. We all need community. I mean, a lot of things seem reasonable when we're by ourselves on our phone at 1 a.m., but maybe that's not the best way to make big decisions. Friends, our gospel is a gospel of reconciliation. And if we want a culture shift, this has to be a conviction for us. Number two, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. To get the kind of culture shift that we're looking for, we've got to have the Holy Spirit. Over and over again in the book of Acts, what we discover is that it's actually the Holy Spirit who's taking the initiative to build a multi-ethnic church. I mean, this begins on the day of Pentecost, the day the church was birthed. Listen to what we happens here. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. 
Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? It means that God is going to build a multi-ethnic church from people from every nation under heaven. I mean, this is why God timed this event to coincide with the Jewish festival. There were Jewish people from all across the Roman Empire in Jerusalem. And this was intended to be a prophetic picture of where the church was going. Every culture, every language, every nation. Later on, in Acts chapter 8, it's the Holy Spirit that leads Philip to the Ethiopian official. In Acts chapter 10, it's the Holy Spirit who connects Peter and Cornelius. In Acts chapter 13, it's the Holy Spirit who calls Paul and Barnabas on their mission to Gentiles across the Roman Empire. And in Acts chapter 15, when James and the other leaders come to their resolution and send a letter back to Antioch, they write this. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. Friends, we need the Holy Spirit. If we're gonna have a culture shift, we need the Holy Spirit. And if that's what you want, I encourage you to do two things every single day. Number one, ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Every single day, ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Secondly, Open your eyes and look around to see where the Holy Spirit is already moving. Look, God is already at work. We don't have to convince him to do something. We just have to open up our eyes, see where he's already moving, and jump in. It's going to take the Holy Spirit to produce the kind of culture shift that we are looking for. Number three, priorities. Priorities. At a critical moment in Acts chapter 15, James addresses the group, and he concluded his address with these words. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Now, what's James saying here? Two very important things. Firstly, people are more important than systems. People are more important than systems. This was Jesus' message over and over again. Jesus didn't come to save systems. Jesus came to save people. Look, any organization that prioritizes systems over people is missing the purpose for which it exists, right? Schools exist for people. Businesses exist for people. Governments exist for people. Churches exist for people. The gospel is for people. See, James's statement is full of wisdom. It's my judgment that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Don't make it difficult. Don't make it difficult. We wanna build communities and organizations in which it is easy for people to thrive. Look, thank God for miracles, but what if it didn't have to take a miracle for a young boy or a young girl to find and discover the purpose that God has for them? It's people over systems. Secondly, James recognized the value of unity and realize that unity requires flexibility. Unity requires flexibility. Now, generally speaking, Jews and Gentiles were starting miles apart from one another. I mean, the way that Gentiles worshiped in pagan temples and ate their sacred meals was offensive to Jewish people. And so James realized if they're going to be able to walk together in unity, the Gentiles were going to have to be sensitive and aware of these offenses to the Jewish people. And so they laid down some guidelines. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Unity requires flexibility. 
Now, I've had all kinds of conversations with people who have attended our live Freedom Church services. And it's not uncommon for a white person to come up to me and say, boy, I have never been in a church that's so exuberant and expressive. Now, on the other hand, I have all, had all kinds of black men and women come up to me and say, wow, I've never been to a church service that is so short and that people are so quiet when you're preaching. Now, obviously, it's all a matter of perspective. But look, if we're going to walk together in unity, we've got to have some flexibility. Sometimes we've got to make some sacrifices, but it's worth it. Unity is worth it. Look, we are better together. And this is what's so powerful, once again, about Martin Luther King Jr. and his vision. I mean, the scope of his vision, it actually embraced all people. I mean, yes, he was obviously passionate for his black brothers and sisters to have justice and to share in the prosperity of the nation. But his vision actually went beyond this to all people. I mean, he told a massive crowd, I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. If we want a culture shift, we've got to prioritize people over systems and unity over comfort. Now, number four, urgency. Urgency. Have you ever noticed that it's not the most important things that get done? It's the urgent things. It's the urgent things that actually get done. See, Paul and Barnabas recognized the urgency of their moment. That's why they led a delegation to Jerusalem to work these things out. MLK recognized the urgency of the moment. That's why he led direct action, nonviolent campaigns all across the South. Look, we've got to recognize the urgency of our moment. If there's anything that our communities and our families and our nation and our churches need right now, it's the gospel of reconciliation. It's the gospel of reconciliation. I mean, have you been following the news? We need to be reconciled with God and reconciled with one another. Now, I believe we can be part of a culture shift in our generation. Look, it takes conviction. It takes the Holy Spirit. It takes having the right priorities. And it takes a sense of urgency. But friends, we were made for this. We were made for this moment. God has been preparing us our entire lives for this moment. The gospel is our urgent call. It's a gospel of reconciliation, a gospel that reconciles us with God and reconciles us with one another. God is doing a miracle once again. He's building his multi-ethnic church and he's calling us to be a miracle maker in our generation. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we recognize that you are at work. Lord, we don't have to convince you to do this. You have already showed us that this is your will. Your Holy Spirit is already going before us. Thank you, God, that because of your son Jesus, we can be reconciled with you and reconciled with one another. Right now, while we're in this moment of prayer, maybe you're watching this today and you're thinking to yourself, I need God. I need God. I know it starts there. I need God. If that's you, I want to encourage you to put all your hope, all your faith, all your confidence in Jesus. Because when we trust in Him, He makes all things new. And not only that, He begins to work in us. He begins to tear down that dividing wall between brothers and sisters. He allows us to reconcile, to do justice, to right the wrongs of the past, and to walk in the glorious vision of a multi-ethnic church. And so God, our prayer is won't you do it wherever we are, in our city, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. God, build a multi-ethnic people for your glory. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends.